Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott, and we are headed to Pennsylvania today. We've never stepped foot in that state, metaphorically speaking. And this is really where the the birth of whiskey takes place. If you look at the lore that comes from America, Pennsylvania is where it all starts. And we have Dad's Hat founder and distiller, Herman Mahalich, that is joining us today. So Herman, thank you for joining the Bourbon Lens podcast. It's fun to be here. It's always fun to talk whiskey with folks who enjoy drinking it. So, Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, Scott, you were the one, I think, that kind of sought this one out. So how did you get to to find out about Dad's Hat? Honestly, I've had more people like recommend this brand to us. And I think a lot of it started on Twitter. So whatever you guys are doing on Twitter, I think people are pretty interested in spreading the gospel of Pennsylvania rye. And I had several people, every time we brought up rye, they were like, have you tried Dad's Hat? Uh, no, and it just kept popping up. And then if you, you follow our uh, colleague, Fred Menick, he's uh, had some nice accolades about dad's hat over the years and most recently. So I think the buzz is out there and I'm glad we finally connected. Glad to be here. Well, we're excited to, to do this podcast. Uh, we were talking beforehand just about the whiskey lore that goes around Pennsylvania in general. And, you know, wanted to, you know, there's a variety of things we want to talk about. Like if I think about in my head and we won't cover all of these, but like, you know, Pennsylvania style rye, like why is it the birthplace of American style whiskey? How did you all get the name? Like all of these questions are like running through my head as like the leader of the the chaos that will ensue on this podcast. Um, because by no means would I qualify myself as a host. I'm the person that can kind of guide the chaos. That's all. I'm just trying to keep the guardrails up. You finally admit that after all these episodes? <laughs> oh, I, I already knew. Once once Michael quit and I took this job, it was like, let's just put the bumpers up and we'll we'll ping pong the the ball around and, and see where we land. Go wherever yes. we get where it takes us. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think that's the beauty of, of whiskey in general, right? Like it's just about having a conversation and we want to know uh, what's going on. And I feel like every time I'm at a bar and I'm talking to someone in the whiskey industry, I just pepper them with questions. And I try to do the exact same thing on here because I want people to know what I'm thinking about and Scott's thinking about. That's ultimately the journey. Okay. So I just rambled. I'm going to ask one question and we're going to get this chaos started. Okay. Pennsylvania style rye. Why is it the birthplace of American style rye in, in your opinion? And what is Pennsylvania style rye at the heart of it? Well, um, it, it goes back to the 1700s when you had um, a lot of people talk about Scotch-Irish, but it was actually German Mennonites and Swiss German Mennonites who, who were really some of the early uh, people bringing whiskey into Pennsylvania. And they were they had a history of using rye back in, in Europe. And they came to Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania as a Quaker colony was a um, – was an open door policy for people, for immigrants, and they were being persecuted in Europe and came to Pennsylvania and they brought their skills with them. And that includes, you know, uh, the Overholzers. That's where old Overholt came from. So Abraham Overholzer was one of those guys whose family came to Pennsylvania. Um, the orig- before Michters was Michters, they were originally the uh, Bombergers, the Bombergers, same thing, another one of those families. So they brought their skills with them and Pennsylvania uh, is a you know in rye is a really easy grain to grow. It grows very well in Pennsylvania, and so you know they kind of put those two things together: the skills they brought and the available raw material. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, part of the origin story. Mm. And uh, and of course the uh, you know that that grew to a very healthy, literally hundreds of distillers across the state of Pennsylvania through the 1800s. Um, the Pennsylvania style was built around that. It was a you know, predominantly uh, rye based. And one of the things we mentioned, we, we allude to it in one of our labels as pre-prohibition style, and that is the, the malt content. Um, there's a, you know, typically if you look back at the old recipes, and we, we did a lot of research and preparation for our, uh, launching our distillery in 2011, we looked at a lot of those recipes and they always uh, contain 15 to 20% of malt, mm. uh, mostly malted barley, sometimes a little bit of malted rye. And uh, so we um, we incorporated the, that thinking into our um, recipe development. So we have 80% rye grain, 15% malted barley, and 5% uh, malted rye. We did uh, our early, uh, in addition to the research we did, because of uh, Carl Stills, we have a Carl Still. Uh, they had an affiliation with Michigan State University at the time. 
and we were able to attend the uh, the seminars they, they ran up there, the Artisan Distillery Program. And they we, we went back and they actually helped us do uh, work through recipe development, including choosing the malt that we're using today, which is a really flavorful two row malt that we think really helps to balance our flavor profile. So all those things together, you have the you know that really deep history. Um, and my own personal you know um, sort of direction was my grandfather in the uh, 100 and some years ago when he was a young man was drinking rye whiskey made at the largest whiskey distillery in North America at the time which was about two miles from my house where I grew up and uh, and he was a rye whiskey guy and when prohibition came along he decided working in the still mill was not so much fun so he left there and started a, um, a speakeasy in the 20s that became our family bar so um, and he was a rye whiskey guy and he was always a fan of the traditional rye whiskey style and which was represented at the end in the 60s and early 70s by a brand that his favorite brand and my dad's favorite brand was um, a brand called Sam Thompson. And uh, so those that's what I have in my mind's eye when, when we're trying when we're creating our whiskeys is that those whiskeys that I remember my grandpa and my dad drinking and and I'm still lucky once in a while to um have people will show up on our doorstep with a, Hey, look, I got a bottle of Sam Thompson. I've uh, somebody, you know, found in their attic. And uh, so we, and there's still, there's one floating around right now. Uh, and I, there's going to be a, a fundraiser in Pennsylvania in a, in a short while where they're going to be offering, uh, you know, you pay a, a fee just to taste through a flight. And that's going to be one of them is an old un unopened early seventies, uh, Sam Thompson rye. So, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's kind of the, you know, trying to paint the picture forward through, you know, where the origins are and uh, where it where it ended up, and so in 2011 when we started, there was nobody making um, Pennsylvania style rye anymore. There's nobody making rye in Pennsylvania. So when we started up, uh, we were the first guys to bring rye whiskey back to its home here in PA. That's awesome. I think the most interesting thing is that that mash bill. A lot of people don't talk about this, but some people think of like barley as like, oh, we're gonna have to sprinkle a little bit in because we need those enzymes, but really any less than like 10% really doesn't produce enough enzymes to, to jumpstart the it, fermentation it's process. It, it's hard. It, I mean, and, and you've probably, you may have heard some of the horror stories about people working with rye is that it can be very foamy and can be very sticky. And much of that problem comes from the bad conversion in your mash. Mm. If you do a good conversion in your mash, you'll have a lot less foaming and a lot less stickiness in the fermenter and in the uh, still. So if you if you don't use uh, the proper amount of enzymes, you'll get more of those issues. And you've probably heard some distillers out there saying, "Oh, rye is a pain to work with. It foams too much. You know, it sticks all over the place." Well, that's that has a lot to do with the fact that you may not be getting proper conversion. And so using the, the those the higher level of enzymes. Um, gets that good conversion and along with it, and this was from something that the Michigan state guys uh, kind of turned us on to saying, Hey, you're going to throw that barley mold in there. You might as well pick some good, something that's going to taste good. I mean, the old typical six row distillers malt doesn't really taste like much. Mm -hmm. So we're using brewer's malt, a two row brewer's malt that has a really, a, brings a lot more flavor to the table. And in uh, which we think really does a nice job of balancing that, the dry spiciness of the rye and that fruitiness of the malt does a nice job of uh, kind of balancing itself together. Yeah. So, so a 95, five raw, not to bash it, but uh, does that necessarily have to include supplemental enzymes? I don't know for sure, but I, I would guess that they are. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if, I mean, and truth be told, we add enzymes to ours as well, just as kind of a belts and suspenders because you know, not getting a good conversion is, can cause you so many problems further down the, the road. Mm -hmm. We absolutely just to absolutely be sure we get enough conversion. We do throw a bit of enzymes in our, in our mash as well. We've run it both ways and it runs just fine because we, you know, we, the, 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 uh, the malts we're using are, are contain the, the right amount, a uh, proper amount of enzymes, but, mm -hmm. um, but we, we, it's not so much adding the enzymes, it's the fact that the malt's not there and, the, and that we think the flavor from the malt is really contributes a lot to, uh, to our, to our flavor profile. So are you an attorney by trade? Cause I only hear attorneys use that term or that phrase belt and suspenders. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so they use it too. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, no, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, yeah. I, I went to business school too, but I'm a, 
uh, my first, I went to a four year program for, for chemical engineering. So yeah, belt and suspenders is something I tell a lot of people I work with and cause I'm an attorney, but You're an attorney. Um, yeah. So it's like, well, we don't have to do it that way, but we're going to do it that way because we're going to make sure. Right. right. So exactly. Exactly. I've never seen you wear belt and suspenders, Scott. Well, I don't, I don't, from a fashion sense, I don't, I don't recommend it, but as a lawyer, if I'm talking, if I'm talking business, we're yeah. putting belt and suspenders on the business, you know, or a business plan just yeah. to make sure <laughs> means your britches haven't gotten too big. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I want to talk about the malted rye, right? Because there, there's not a lot of people that are, are malting that that's that grain just in general. The only one I can think of Scott and, and correct me if I'm wrong, like if you have known anymore, there's old Petrero, right? That has done the hundred percent malted rye. And so one of the things that I find really interesting about that, it, it makes the rye more caramelly. And so you can get some of those, um, bourbon notes that come out of that malting of the rye versus the freshness of just your, your regular, your rye right. content. So like what, what's your thought on, on creating that malted rye? I know it's only a little bit, but it, it's still some to give you that, that flavor profile and characteristic. That's exactly right. You know, that, that, that roasting of the rye gives you a little bit more of that caramely flavor to it. And it also, what we find anyway, to my palate, is that it brings a bit of a licorice, uh, like an anise uh, flavor to it as well. And, it, you know, we threw it in there just to kind of on a lark to begin with. But uh, we do like that that extra little dimension to it because, you know, the, that's one of the things that's fun about whiskey is that, you know, you can, you by adding another layer there, even though it's a small note, it's just it, 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 when you taste your whiskey, you like to discover those little things, you know, like you're, you go, Oh, look, you know, you, you just take a sip and you go, Oh, what was that? You take another sip. What was that? And it's a, it kind of adds the kind of the fun of discovery of all the different things that you can incorporate into the layers of your uh, the whiskey flavor. Mm. No, I, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. And I, uh, I was drinking, you know, the white rye, right. Is uh, that's something where we haven't talked about, but like I started there just to kind of get a sip of it it's really similar to white dog, like is the, is the best way, but like you get a good understanding of what those grains are doing in that, um, uh, mash bill. Cause it, it is, it is fruit forward. It's got a lot of flavor. And you know, a lot of times when you drink white distillate, it just comes off hot and like you use it literally as hand sanitizer. This is yeah. super, super smooth and easy to sip on neat, right? I don't say that a lot about clear spirits in general. I, I thought that was an easy sipper and a great introduction just to understand how the grains are working together as we get into the maturation of, you know, the whiskey that we have in front of us because we have a variety of things to get into. So I guess my, my thing, and, and Scott would love your opinion, you know, why why white dog or why the, the, the dad's hat rye. And like, how do you put that into your overall or lineup of, of products that you have in the marketplace and how do you position it? We don't, we don't sell a lot of it. I mean, in the beginning we did, it was the only thing we had until we had some aged whiskey. So we, of course we, you know, we're selling it, but it, 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 it stays around because we have um, particularly on the East coast with in New York, there's a, there's a actually a bar in New York who's developed a, a really fantastic uh, white Manhattan recipe uh, using uh, Lillet and um, uh, Luxardo Maraschino and, and making Manhattan out of it like that. Um, and so up at like from the Maryland Eastern Shore through New Jersey and New York, a fair amount of bars have picked up on it for making cocktails. Um, although we have one guy who stops by and, you know, he buys it at the distillery every once in a while and he likes to drink it neat. So, you know, um, Frankly, my favorite thing to do with it is to put it in a barrel and make whiskey out of it. But, uh, <laughs> but, it's, uh, it's just not ready yet. <laughs> it's just not ready yet. But, but I, I do, uh, you know, I do take, I have a bottle over here on my bar and I'll take uh, a bottle and I'll put a Serrano pepper in it and let that sit for a while and make, um, make margaritas out of it uh, and things like that. So it's, it's fun to play with. It, it's a neat uh, cocktail ingredient because it has a, you know, it's got that fruitiness, but it's got a little bit of funk mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, you know, it's, it's, um, and it's so you can play with it and do some fun things with it. So. Yeah. So uh, before this, uh, for everyone that's listening, I had a I had an accident, and I, I made an oopsie, and I spilt uh, half of my sample that Scott gave me uh, all over everything, and it smelled great. So that's half the battle. Is it just made the the aroma of the the evening a little bit better? Um, Scott, I know you like aged whiskey, 
but you are a gin drinker. Like, so what, what's your mm-hmm. ex- experience with this clear spirit and what's your opinion? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's great. I haven't tried it in a cocktail, but I think that that's where it's obviously positioned is yeah. let's turn it into a cocktail. But the reason I talked to Herman before the podcast and I was like, Hey, let's, let's try that. Because if we were at the distillery, we'd probably ask, Hey, let's taste some of the white dog. Cause that's what we want to taste. How does it taste before it actually hits some age? Yep. So as a progressive tasting, I think that's a great place to start yep. to say, this is what the, the distillate tastes like at a hundred proof. Now that's, that's where you guys proof it too. I'm not sure how high you distill it, but hundred proof. I think it's still very well balanced. It's got a great mouthfeel to not have been aged at all. It still has a, it's very viscous and it's not hot. Like, like Jake says, you know, white dog typically is just rocket fuel. Uh, this one I think is a great way to lead into the tasting rocket fuel. That just made me laugh. <laughs> and I think that it's maybe a good segue. You got, you, you mentioned earlier that you might want to talk about the, the still, and this might be a good time to do that. Uh, yeah. We, um, you know, we have a pot still, but we have a five plate side column. So we're able to deploy that side column as we like to clean up the edges on our, on our distillate. So one of the things that we do, and, uh, and we, this was reinforced by the discussion I had with the representative from Carl on Friday is how we run the early part of our, uh, the very beginning of the, uh, the distillation where we do a really, 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 uh, sharp heads cut. Um, that's one of the things that, you know, in a white spirit that is where you don't have the ability to take that sharp cut, you're going to get some of those late tails and some of those things that they sometimes smell good, but they, they're a little rough on the palate. And um, so we're, we do a really careful, sharp heads cut, particularly on what's going to go into our white and what's going to go into our uh, younger whiskeys that, that are, you know, less than two years old. So uh, we make that those cuts using uh, this using alternately, you know, increased uh, water going to the condenser and reflux or closing the plates, things like that. We can play with that and manipulate uh, how we run the cuts. Mm. Now, if we're going to, if we're running the still to make uh, the whiskey that's going to go into the 53s and age four years and older, uh, we, we let the, we let, we open those up. We, we let that, let some of that, that stuff flow in because we know those things are going to turn into real fun flavors uh, down the road. They might be a bit unpleasant when they're young, mm. but down the you know, after four years in a barrel, they, they 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 mature into tasty flavors. So, are you making your cut on the column part, or are you making like where are you making your cuts off, on, off the column? Yes, off the column. Okay, and you're doing like a double distillation technically through the pot. Yeah, we we do a, we do a strip. Yeah, and then we redistill. The strip is is just on the pot to the condenser, yep. no column. And then we do the second installation where we we deploy the column as needed to clean up um, the, those cuts. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that was like one of the hardest things for me to really truly understand. Like distillation process is for pot distillation. You know, is it double distilled? Is it not double distilled? Is it does it have a stripping column? Does it not? Right. There's a lot of nuances to it. So that's like Scott always says, I like to nerd out about this, but I think it's from a nuance perspective. You know, I, I hear from time to time people say is one's distillery. You know, if you've seen one distillery, you've seen all of them. That's, that's incorrect. Right. Like, yes, the process is making whiskey, right? We get that, but how you get to the end product can be completely different. Um, and that leads me to the other nerdy question I like to ask is how do you age your barrels, right? Are you in traditional ricking? Are you in uh, palletized warehouses? Are you in wood? Are you in cement? Are you in, um, sheet metal? Like how are you all aging your whiskey? Uh, cause Pennsylvania has some weird climate swings. Right. Well, the, 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 a lot of the tradition in, uh, in, uh, just before prohibition and just after in Pennsylvania were, uh, what they would call cli- you know climate controlled or, or temperature controlled warehouses, and uh, they were typically uh, brick, steam heated warehouses. And we're not too far from that. We have we're in an old in an old textile mill, and um, 
we age our barrels in two different places. We have the main distillery, which is about 6,000 square feet on the main uh, on the ground floor. Uh, and then we, uh, we have access to the fifth floor in this big old mill. And we take our barrels up there, but they're, they're all uh, laying down on racks. They're not, um, they're not palletized. And, um, and upstairs is a bit more, uh, le less, let's say, less swings in temperature. It's more of a steady uh, temperature control. It's a very old building, so the walls are, it's a, you know, the, like I'm about a foot thick. So it, it that never really gets that cold in there in the wintertime, and in the summertime, it, it gets nice and warm. So, um, the, the, and so we do see a big difference between the barrels that go upstairs versus the one that stay downstairs. Mm. Now, we're still using 15-gallon barrels. We're blending 15s with 53s now. And we're we're trying to figure out a way to, to wean ourselves and over the next two years go to our classic will we'll be all 53-gallon uh, barrels. But for the time being, we're still using 15s mm. uh, just because from a necessity of, of just trying to keep our production up and moving product out the door. And plus, frankly, I, I think our 15-gallon whiskey, our classic rye, which you don't have with you right now, but it's a it's it's a great cocktail whiskey and, and I, I love it. You know, I, I know there's a lot of purists out there will shake their heads and, and at me, but I mean, that, that whiskey is great on the rocks whiskey. I mean, it's a, it's a really nice, it's a great uh, summertime drinker on the rocks with a little squeeze of lemon on it. Mm. It's a great, uh, or even in a, uh, like a um, Ryan ginger highball. Fantastic. So, um, so we're still in those 15s all stay downstairs. Yeah. Um, we also have a rack in the back of the distillery where we pick a couple of 53s before we send the rest of them upstairs and we put them, we put them there. So we will have some of those 53s downstairs that age differently. And, um, and it's, it, we were just going through this process today where we're, we spent uh, the morning uh, tasting barrels from 2017 to start selecting our uh, 2022 bottle and bond release. And um, so we had some of, of those 17s that were on the downstairs rack and the rest of them from, were from upstairs. So we take them upstairs. We don't touch them for four years. We bring them back downstairs. So we just brought a bunch downstairs from 2017. And we are, um, we're trying to find the right combination of the downstairs and upstairs barrels that will make the, the 2022 uh, bottle and bond release. So when, you, when you're doing 15 gallons, how, how are they aging comparatively to the 53, right? Obviously 53, you're going to get a lot more expansion contraction. There's a little, there's a lot more variables happening in a 15. It, it can be short, right? So like, what's your experience with the timing? Uh, now that you got eight years underneath, you had almost a decade of aging these barrels. Like what's your perception on how they, how they finish out aging? The, the 15s, we only age that stuff between nine months and a year. That's it. Mm. Because if we, if we leave it in there longer, it, it just gets, it picks up too much barrel. Yeah. And part of what we like about our, our classic rye is that you get a lot of that, you know, that young distillate, the young, the young rye grain forward flavor and the fruit, that fruity flavor from the, um, from the malt it, it is, is, it, and you don't want to step all over it with the, uh, with the barrel. And frankly speaking, those smaller barrels can give you something that's a little too, little too woody, a little too tannic if you let it go too long in a small barrels. Hmm. So we, we very rarely go over a year in those little barrels. Yeah. So in the 15s, the 53s are all minimum four. Okay. Years. So when you, when you do get to the 53s, you all are going above, you know, a lot of people put rye out there at, at three years, you're going above to four years, which is your bottle and bond at minimum price. Bottle and bond and our straight, our, our, the green label straight, that's all four years or older. Okay. Um, we're contemplating doing a younger, uh, younger rye in the 53s, two to between two and four. Mm. Um, again, kind of capturing the younger spirit, in which and rye does. You know, it's, you mentioned Old Potero before. It's one of the, you know, uh, the they you know, they they always were proponents of the rye being from a younger, uh, you know, ready to drink a little uh, younger than a bourbon would be. <clears throat> and we and we think that's a it's a it's a nice uh, contrast to the older whiskey. So we're gonna we're gonna look to maintain that with a two to four years in a fifty three. And start to phase. We we might keep some 15s only because we get we get really surprised sometimes. We get some, we'll get some 15s that are just really delicious, and we we like to keep those around. So we'll see. And we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're uh, play making it up as we go along a little bit here. You know we're you know we don't have 50 years in the business, so we're <laughs> um, but and and the thing is the bottom line between myself and, and John Cooper, my business partner, 
um, it comes down to what we like, you know, and, and that's, you know, if we don't like it, we won't sell it. If we like it, we, and we'll sell it. And if, if, if you like it, great. If you don't like it too bad, because we're not going to sell it unless we like it. So. Um, yeah. You know, as we're progressing now from the white rye into the, the 95 pre prohibition style, you know, I love this tasting flight as a whiskey nerd tasting through these whiskeys as it progresses through, I think it's definitely a great way for, for you to show this product and show, you know, what your portfolio is because most people are looking at it and they're like, it's all the same distillate, but it's so crazy how it's so unique across these four bottles that we have in front of us. You know, it's yeah, and one of the things that, that, that there, in fact, there's a, if you go from the green labels, 95, which is our four-year-old and, and um, straight through that progression, the, the, one of the differentiators, and it's something, I, you know, you guys probably know better than I do. I, I don't get out enough. I spend too much time at the distillery, but <laughs> one of the things that we do and we've done from the beginning is that we have 6,000 liter uh, vatting tanks or blending tanks. So for, so that green label, and we do the same for our classic uh, not a 90 proof as well is that barrels go in and whiskey comes out, but the, but the tank never empties. Like a so, Solera barrel. It's sort of, you know, so, but it's a 6,000 liter tank. So yeah. like right now there is about uh, 4,000 liters in the classic tank and about 3,000 liters in the, in the straight tank. And we were picking out more barrels today to go into the straight tank to get the level up. So, cause when we, when we bottle next, we want to enough to rest in that uh, tank. So the next time we add barrels, it's blending with what we bottled last time. So that oh. green label straight is like an infinity uh, bottle. You know, it's, it just keeps getting new things added to it. And what John and I uh, endeavor to do is uh, choose barrels that are going to maintain stylistically consistency in the, in those, uh, in those barrels, in that, in that, in that tank. So, you know, if, if we think it's getting a little too spicy, we might f- try to find some barrels that will bring a little more fruit and keep that uh, balance. Because when we talk to uh, customers and particularly with bars who want to use it for cocktails, they want to, they want to know that you're going to, they're going to be able to find uh, the same general, you know, flavor profile. You know, we're trying to be stylistically consistent. We know we're not going to be hundred percent consistent because we don't, you know, when you dump hundreds of thousands of barrels, it's easier to maintain that. But so we do that by screening what goes in. And uh, so that is on the green label. That comes from that, that vatting process. The bottle and bond process is we go through and, and last year, I think we picked about a dozen barrels. Um, and every year we've tried to select barrels that contrast from the previous year. Um, 2019 was crazy spicy. Uh, really, really like, you know, uh, uh, cherry pepper spicy. Uh, 2020 was really pretty. It was like a floral pretty selection. The 2021 you have in front of you, uh, we called it our German chocolate cake. It's it's cherries and chocolate. Um, and this year, we just spent the, the morning tasting barrels trying to figure out what 2022 is going to be. Um, and then the third bottle you have is, a, is an absolute single barrel. It's just one barrel that we felt, thought was unique enough to pull off on its own. And that was a 53 gallon barrel, 53 gallon barrel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now that you explain it, I, now I see why there's so much variation amongst these. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I think the Solera process or whatever we call it, the hybrid Solera, you know, vatting. I think that's, that's very interesting because you're trying to create consistency over a longer period of time right. by like, I think a lot of distillers have used this term spice rack, like using the different spices to incorporate and make things more consistent. Right. Well, I think what's really interesting is like going from the 95 to the bottle and bond, like you can get a little more spice. Like you said, I think the the 95 was a little more sweet, was more that chocolate cherry note that you mentioned. The the, the bottle and bond has a little bit of that peppercorn, like rye spice to it that kind of oh, yeah. lingers with you. It's, it's, I feel like this is like a true representation of what I know rye as. And I'm not saying that is right or wrong, but like what my palate recognizes rye is, I feel like that bottle and bond like hits it. It's 
full of flavor. It's bright. It's citrusy. And it's got like some peppercorn um, spice to it uh, on the back end that kind of lingers in the in the esophagus a little bit in a, in a good way. Like I, I think that one's, you know, just really warming to the to the body and the palate. Um, so it, I think the maltiness shows up more in the 95. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Which, which going back to Old Potrero, one of my early tasting notes when I first tasted this, I guess a couple of weeks back, I said, damn, I need to, co- I need to compare that to Old Potrero. It says, reminds me of Old Potrero. Grab a bottle of Old Potrero. I haven't done that yet, but maybe I'll do that after this podcast. But that malty rye is such a unique flavor that I don't experience very often because I don't think many people do that. No. Not at all. I, it, it just lends to you how much creation you have with the grain variable, right? And then in just playing with water even, right? It can pull out such different distillations. And then you go with this, we'll call it Solera for just the, the normal person. The lay person may understand that a little bit better. Um, you know, the, that process, that vatting process, you got um, the consistency, but the bottle and bond's got to be from one season. Like there's there's a lot of, you know, constraints even on that right to as you make it so even that five you know five points non solera process you know gets a gets a, a little bit nuanced um in 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 the bottle and bond which those are great like i've i've really enjoyed this cuz it's giving me something different to my palate and one of the things it's it's made me do it's like making my my palate uh like thirsty like i don't know like it i, I can't i don't have a in, I have this insatiable thirst to keep drinking. Um, that could be a bad thing, but that's good for you all, right? Like I'm enjoying my dad's hat raw. <laughs> it's one of the things they talk about with some of the malts too, is they, they know you, you catch sort of like on the outside of your tongues where your mouth kind of waters a bit. And I think that's something that you see here. A lot of Scotch guys talk about as well. Yeah. I mean, I like rye, but this is a unique take on it. Um, and I think that's what I I like about it because it's, it's so different. Um, and it's almost like the bourbon version, like a Kentucky bourbon style rye, like flipped, like you're switching the ingredients, right? Main, main corn mash bill, your main rye mash bill. And then you have the other three distilling grains in it. I think it's really interesting how it, it all plays and it's more nuanced than just 95, five, like we talked about, not to bash it, but it's just more nuanced. Those guys make good whiskey, man. They've been making whiskey a long time. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Um, but yeah, it, we, we are looking for a distinct style. And again, one of the, you know, at the end of the day, you know, John and I, you know, are the arbiters of what goes out the door and, you know, it's what is, this is what we like, you know? So, and there's no, we have no other basis for, for, you know, for bad evaluation. I mean, you know, I grew up in a household where rye was uh, kind of the, uh, the, you know, the, the whiskey of choice and John's got a more varied palate. He's a scotch drinker and, and, and bourbon drinker. And um, so he brings a lot more sort of an almost an analytical approach to it. Um, so we put those things together and, and we come up with things that we like the best. And, um, and that's, you know, I don't know if you want to, um, that, you know, that's in that single barrel there is, is a great example of where we, like we, we were just, we, we had another, um, barrel that we were looking at for a single barrel for somebody and we just decided to put it on the side that's going to be the, i think it's going to be the next founders four barrel uh because we we liked it so much we were we um we had a customer in a not in kentucky but uh another state not too not too far from you guys uh who's looking for a, it, that barrel and i think we're going to keep it on the side so um, <laughs> we won't tell them yeah <laughs> no. uh i tell you what though 100 122 scott is that- 126.4 doesn't drink that warm mm. but it is packed full of flavor that is that's pretty close to the, the favorite whiskey uh, that we've made you know uh we you know we, we had a um our ball and bond in 2019 i have one bottle of that left sitting over there and it, that's i don't know if any more exist out there but man that's that's a really good one but this one the um Founders three. Now, unfortunately, that one's only available in Pennsylvania. Um, we um, uh, and so that's, but it's. We hesitate to talk about it a lot because you know, well, we used to be hesitant, you know, but we 
But we think that even though everybody can't get that, we still think it's representative of what we can do. Oh, uh-huh. so if you see a single barrel and they're they're out there, we have you know we've done single barrels with Bevmo in California and with with uh, you know uh, Total Wine and with other retailers and a few in Kentucky as well, particularly up in Covington and you know in the northern part of the state. Um, you know we think it's representative of what, what we can deliver. So you know um, we're proud of the of the single barrels we bring out and we've. They they are available in other states, but not exactly the same ones. So we think uh-huh. it's representative of what we can deliver. The cinnamon and clove note on the nose, and then like just full of just like spicy goodness, and like um, just like it's evergreen. It's just I don't know. I, I think this one is just it doesn't blow the other ones out of the water, but it's just like a huge like. Woof. <laughs> It's very, it's really unique. It's, it's fun. It's a, you know, and that's what, you know, when we find these, these, these barrels, we, 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 we decided now when we find these ones that are a little more unique and, and that barrel had on the same day, we filled probably 12 barrels that day. And I can tell you, it's brothers and sisters were good, but they weren't like that. And they weren't like that. So, I mean, uh-huh. it's probably, you know, it, it, you know, you don't know exactly how that happened, but that's what happened. So. Yeah, I mean it's what five and a half years old, five and a half year rye. It's yeah. packing a lot of flavor. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it does it takes you kind of on a ride. Mm-hmm. It's really it's just really interesting how how just different maturation. Like, did that barrel get like one inch more time in char, right? Or did it have a crack of sunlight somehow hit it? Or like, there's just all these weird variables that could yeah, happen. We don't know that you you don't know um but like that one i think is just what you can expect like fully unfiltered dad's hat like you're getting a super solid rye whiskey um at your fingertips that packs a punch and gives you some and it's got some caramel and vanilla in it even too right it's is the more like i kind of like let it linger on my palate i'm getting different flavors uh, and I know I'm talked about this one probably more than the others, but this one just has been impactful to my palate overall. Well, you know, uh, Herman, you said you don't like to talk or you used to not like to talk about the single barrels that everybody couldn't get. But I mean, if people can find single barrels and it's anywhere close to this, I mean, five and a half year old rye whiskey that's of a different rye mash bill that most people probably aren't familiar with. You know, everybody's 95 or 90 rye or Kentucky rye, which is just corn. Um, this is just super unique that if somebody comes across a single barrel of dad's hat, like you said, Northern Kentucky, Pennsylvania, a few other states, total wines. If you come across it, I think you should just grab it just to try it. There, I mean, I, I can't really, uh, it, we're about three weeks before I can spill the beans about it, but there's, we have a couple, they're going to be going on retailers who are more available. Uh, well, we've done a single barrel in the past with, with seal box. Mm. Uh, so people like that, um, who are going to be, who have made decisions about picking out some barrels are going to be available soon. And some people who are still on the fence. So, but we, there should be some announcements coming out in the next couple of weeks about, you know, retailers who, where they're, they're able to ship it around more than just going through the typical channels. We're, I mean, we're in, we're in like 22 States now, mm. uh, let's say new England down to Maryland. We're in Georgia. We're in uh, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Minnesota, uh, California, Nevada, Arizona. Uh, so everybody that's listening right now, yeah, he just he just named your state. Exactly. <laughs> that, those so are go, like literally you named it. all of our main markets. <laughs> and so and so we're we're in special order in a few places. We just shipped out uh, a big uh, big order of four cases to Wyoming. Hey, um, yeah, you know so. Hey, uh, that he that that's a, he said an empty fifty three foot trailer to pick it up. <laughs> so, it was hilarious. I had to put it in a cardboard <laughs> box for the guy to put it in the back. <laughs> that serves for uh, the entire state of Wyoming. <laughs> It must be. Uh, so we, uh, the, so it's, but I mean, you know, we're happy to, happy to folks have heard about it and one that, you know, would like to pick it up. Yeah, we're, we're available in Europe. Oh, cool. Um, we've been there for a while 
it, things really got rough there during the tariffs and everything else. Yeah. And so we, they, we haven't had an order from uh, Europe in a while, but we'll, we're looking at maybe going in through a different uh, avenue now. We've been, we've been available in Taiwan as well. Aren't you just fancy? You're you're international. That's our second largest listenership. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't well, really know. You know it was, it's funny because the guy who's the who's the uh, president of the Philadelphia Whiskey Society or club is from Taiwan, and one of his uh, guy he knows came to visit Philadelphia, and he turned him on to our whiskey. And this guy happens to be uh, in uh, he's a he, in the importing business in Taiwan. So he called me up and said, would you be willing to sell us your whiskey? And I'm like, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes and if yes. If you have money, I'll sell it to you for sure. So they, uh, so yeah, we're, uh, it, it's taken a little bit of a bump because they, they even though Taiwan started uh, really well with COVID, they've really t- had a, taken a beating in the past uh, six months. I think they're starting to come out of it again. Uh, but the, um, so we'll see how things go there. Um and we they, sell. They need some single barrels with this high proof. I think that it would help cure some of that. <laughs> well, one thing we are selling them. We're selling them proof. We're selling them. Uh, the only place we sell this product is in Taiwan, and at the uh, uh, at the farm stand at the Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia. It's our uh, unfiltered unfiltered cast strength whiskey, which is basically whatever's in that vatting tank at the time. We put it in a barrel, or we put it in a bottle. And we sell it and we literally just bottle it right out of the tank. I mean, we, we don't do much filtering anyway. We don't do any chill filtering, but this literally is like, you know, chunks and all. And uh, so that's the unfiltered cast strength. And the, the guy in Taiwan asked me about it because the guy in Philly told him about it. <laughs> uh, and so it's only for sale uh, in uh, at the Reading Terminal Market in Philly and in Taiwan. So is that like a special bottling or is it like a, yeah, it's, just, yeah, it's, we, it's got a different label and everything. It's a wow. unfiltered cast strength is what we call it. That's, and it's got like the chunks floating in it. Yep. Oh, if you're it's got a little grit. It's got a little grit to it. Scott, we're not far off from Taiwan though. Like India is our second largest country from a listenership perspective. We, we have been available in India in the past. See, I, and you know, I'm just, I'm just helping, helping Herman here. It's pulling uh, the stats. I'm pulling, <laughs> pulling the stats, you know, give it, give we it all were, info. We, we have been on the bar at what is one of probably one of the fanciest bars in the world in Singapore is the Manhattan bar in Singapore. Uh, we're on the bar there. I feel like everything is fancy in Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> like every, everything I've ever seen from Singapore just seems like I can't afford it. <laughs> It's, it's a pretty interesting place. I, I, I used to back in my, before, in my real job, before I started this business, I was uh, spent some time in, in Asia and Singapore is a pretty interesting place. So yeah. Sure. I, uh, I, Asia just in general, like always um, excites me from a travel perspective. So uh, I need to, to explore that. Um, not right now, as we all know. So we'll, we'll leave that as, as where we are. Um, but the, the one last thing is, you know, that I have, how'd you come up with the name? Well, uh, you can't really see him here, but, uh, I have, um, you got your dad's hat. I got a bunch of them. I have a whole wall of them over here. There we go. <laughs> there it is. That's one of many. Um, my father passed away as a pretty young man because I'm approaching the age of my father died, which is getting scary. But so, um, and, and as you can tell, so tell, I, I don't have much hair. So, <laughs> I started wearing these fedora hats and um, we were working with a um, company in Philadelphia, Signature Communications, who's done our branding and they're, they're the agency we use for all that stuff. And uh, they came up with the name Dad's Hat based on the fact that my dad and my grandpa were both rye whiskey guys. I grew up at a bar and and uh, the hat kind of reminded them of, of um, what, what's genius about what they've done is that he, the, the backstory is fun. You know, my dad, my grandpa, um, but it's also, if you look at that label, one of the things we were trying to communicate about the brand is that we're, we were bringing rye whiskey back to its home, you know, and it's, so we wanted to communicate a certain nostalgia along, you know, with the brand. Yeah. And we think the fedora kind of does that because it, when you see a fedora hat like that, it kind of makes you think of, you know, maybe a, a, an uncle who wore hats or maybe your favorite movies or maybe Mad Men or something like that. But it's also, it, all, it always evokes a certain nostalgia. Perfect. And also, I'm just showing Jake this on the back of the bottle, but it says 
the perfect fit. Well, we, we need we need a fedora times two for the size of my head. Well, there's a perfect bottle out there for you. <laughs> so yeah, we have I have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten hats in this office right now. <laughs> yeah. So is is the hat that's on the bottle one of the hats that that you inherited, or is that a yeah, hat it, that like it's, you... a, it's fashioned after one of the hats I have. It's it's fashioned after here it is there it is this one here i feel like that's a that's a cigar smoking hat or or a churchill downs hat he's gonna go watch the ponies with that one so yeah so that's another one you got you got your program you got your cigar and your mint julep uh a rye mint julep and uh he's ready to roll well we call well we in pennsylvania we call a rye mint julep we call that a whiskey smash so we'll Okay, whiskey, whiskey smash it is. I'm I'm not a mint julep fan, so it is what it is. Um, so we we've talked about a lot, and I'm I'm super excited to uh, steal more of uh, Scott's bottles that he has over at his house, um, because this single barrel is to die for. Um, you know, Herman, when when people want to find out more about your all's product and services, like where can they? F- find out more information on, on dad's hat. Um, our website is a uh, dad's hat Um, so there's a you know f- fair amount of information there. There is one of the pages that I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with my communications people tomorrow. I'm, I'm, they don't make some of the links uh, easy enough to find. So you have to go to the little, you know, stacked uh, hamburger menu and look for, there's a video page uh, and we have some pretty interesting videos there, uh, including one that was, it's about the fifth one down, I think which does a really nice job of conveying sort of the DNA of our brand. Mm. Um, it gives, you get some nice images of the, um, of the distillery. There's a drone shot of the farm uh, where we get our rye from, which is, you know, I didn't mention the farm. We, you know, we work with the, the Mies family. The Mies family has been on that land since 1716. Uh, you know, and we have a great partnership with them. Uh, they do a great job of, of waiting until the last minute to harvest a really ripe, rye berry for us. So you get to see all that stuff. It's a little schmaltzy because the guy who did it is actually a uh, videographer from National Geographic. <laughs> and he, uh, so he, he did a really nice job with music and and my voiceover and all this stuff like that and his dramatic shots. But it doesn't, I think it, it shows sort of the, the DNA of the brand. So it's a really nice video. And there's a few other ones that are, that are pretty interesting. Um, so in general, if the website's a good source, we could, you could follow us for latest information. We're on Instagram. We're most active on Instagram. We're a little bit. Facebook's becoming such a pain, uh, pain to work. <laughs> yes, uh, you know um, they keep changing the layout and the format, and you know it, it's it's just a it's a pain to work with. Um, and we do we're a bit on Twitter too, but mostly these days, uh, if you want to you know see what's coming out and things like that, on is uh, Instagram. Whatever you guys are doing on Twitter is working because, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I've had multiple people say, you know at dad's hat gotta gotta check out this rye so whatever you guys are doing people are noticing we so as much. We, maybe we should pick it up again but uh but we because we've been it ends up with uh, instagram being the the one that's less cluttered and because twitter just gets so cluttered so fast um mm-hmm. but, um we like i think we're, we 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 do a bit on on uh, twitter still um well for all of our listeners check the show notes there will be a link to the video that Herman just referenced and ov- obviously all the socials and yeah. uh, website, but yeah, definitely check the, check the show notes on our website and, uh, and come check it out for yourself. Soon, you'll find out more about those, those single barrels that will be more widely available through whatever, as you know, it's state by state that the rules are different, but uh, there were, there will be more widely available from a couple sources. And uh, that'll be announced soon. And we'll be choosing our 2022 bottle and bond, mm. which will be available in several states, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, California, Tennessee. Who else buys it? Um, Massachusetts. So it'll in New Jersey. So it'll be pretty widely available. The, the 2021 is still out there. The 2021 there's a, in the stores in PA, of course, but we just shipped uh, the last of it to, um, the 2021 to Kentucky and, and uh, Tennessee has it. So it's, it's out there. If you want to send us a, send us the details on where it's at, 
we can definitely drop it in the show notes. I mean, we've obviously got a lot of Kentucky listeners, but we got listeners all over too. So yeah. Hey, Jake, single barrel shared pour. <laughs> make it happen. Yay. We, we can make that happen. Uh, we got an online retailer we work with. So, you know, we will send out the samples or if you guys want to make a road trip, come by the distillery and climb around the racks with us, you know, we'll put on our boots. I'm, I'm always <laughs> down to, to make a, a car ride and to Philly. It's probably nine hours. Yeah. 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 Which part, which part of Kentucky are you in? We're in Louisville. Louisville. Yeah. yeah so just, straight up through Ohio and over. Yeah. So we got a couple total wines here. I know you said you guys work with them. So yeah, I think sure the, the one total wine there, uh, they may have a couple of old ones sitting around from the last time they picked one. I don't know if we've had the last pick we had in, in, uh, I'm trying to, I can't remember the last pick we had. I, if I find the last pick we had from Kentucky, they, they still have some, uh, around, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you a note. Yeah, cool. You can include it. Um, Definitely. The, um, you know, when you're driving, if you make the drive out across Pennsylvania, as you're driving on Route 70, before you join the Pennsylvania Turnpike, you cross the Monongahela River. As you are crossing the Monongahela River on that bridge, you look down to your left, right to the bottom of that bridge on the on the western bank or the eastern bank of the river, was the Gibson uh, Gibson Distillery, which is the right up three miles from my house where I grew up, and that's the distillery that was the largest distillery in North America from 1850s until uh, until Prohibition was located right there, making rye whiskey. So that's the rye whiskey that my grandfather cut his t- teeth on was made right there. Literally, that because that's that's how they literally cut their teeth back then. Yeah. <laughs> Herman, thank you so much for for joining tonight. It was a pleasure, right? You know, I love, love talking whiskey with folks who enjoy it too. So. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for the samples. I don't think we do that enough um, with people that send us um, whiskey as we talk to them. Thank you so much because it allows us to have a really good conversation with you. So, so thank you for, for doing that and, and just being fun to talk to. It was, it was really good. And uh, it's always great to have a uh, good conversation. Great. So as we close out tonight, thank you everyone for listening to another episode of The Bourbon Lens. We really appreciate it. If you would go like, rate us, give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast listening app. Follow us on all your social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, begrudgingly, at Bourbon Lens. And lastly, go check out patreon.com backslash bourbon lens, exclusive opportunities to interact with us as well as um, some distillers in the industry. Uh, And lastly, we will have a slew of single barrels that are coming out. Um, As of today, there are a few Penelope barrels left. Uh, Our Starlight VDN Rye, um, our Frey Ranch pick is coming out as well as our Salterns finished broken barrel. So there's a lot of whiskey that's going to be able to be purchased through sharedpour.com you follow us we'd greatly appreciate it if you go buy one of those barrels and until next time cheers see you fellas